Hey everyone, Jack here. Mikola is probably the most mysterious character in Elden Ring. You know, there's so much information about him in game, yet it's impossible to know who he is or what his motivations are. He's seemingly not involved with the main story at all, but when we look under the surface, uh, you find his influence everywhere. If you watched my previous videos, either the Eclipse or the Sage's Cave video, you would know that my perspective is that Mikola has been pulling the strings this entire time, whether it's the Knight of the Black Knives or our player character's involvement within the story of Elden Ring. I've seen comments on my videos saying that my content is proof that Mikola is, without a doubt, a stand-in for Griffith from the legendary manga Berserk. Uh, I'm not too shocked by this, I mean, you know, the main character within most of my videos is either me or the Black Swordsman cosplay, you know, guts. Uh, but I want to dispel that notion that Mikola is supposed to represent Griffith. Mikola is not Griffith, but there is a character who is. Don't trust a mimic on appearance alone. If you do, then I'm sure Patches has a chest he'd like to sell you at the bottom of Sen's Fortress. Shout out to Antos, who recently released a video comparing Mikola to Griffith, as well as looking into some cut content. It's a very interesting video. I recommend you watch it. It'll be linked either there or there and linked down there. Um, there's a lot of videos out there comparing Mikola to Griffith, many of them, and all of them are really good. I watched uh, quite a few before uh, doing this video and writing the script. If you are unaware of the story of Berserk or what it is, here's a brief synopsis. I recommend you read the manga. It's very good, but trigger warning, there is, you know, depictions of very graphic violence and uh, essay, you know, to say safely. So if those are things that upset you, I would recommend not reading Berserk. But if they don't bother you too much, uh, I would recommend reading it. So for those uninitiated, uh, Berserk is the masterpiece manga by the late and great Kentaro Mura and one of the most apparent documented influences on Hidetaki Miyazaki's games, uh, all the way back to Demon's Souls. If you're interested, there's a great YouTube channel called Don Don RV, uh, I'll link it there, 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 where he goes through each game and shows the references to Berserk, as well as interviews with Miyazaki confirming his influence. The story follows Guts, the Black Swordsman, throughout his entire life, from birth to present day, as he struggles with being brought up in a life of war and violence, the betrayal from his loved ones, as well as this inner conflict that he has of wanting to seek revenge and violence, of him trying to choose to do either the thing that's right but difficult, or the thing that he wants that's easy. Uh, he also fights giant monsters with a big F.U. sword. Uh, the great sword in Elden Ring is uh, mimics <laughs> his uh, Dragon Slayer sword. The two primary antagonists are Griffith, Guts' friend and commander turned sworn enemy, and the God Hand, a group of interdimensional beings who attempt to manipulate human history using causality in order to enact some unknown plan. In this sense, causality in Berserk is used as a way to force people into doing things they wouldn't do if they could choose to. Uh, such as setting up an event where, you know, you make someone incredibly desperate so they'll do something rash and violent in order for the God Hand to push their scheme forward. A brief summary of who Griffith is, he is this enigmatic leader of a mercenary group called the Band of the Hawk, and he has this dream of attaining his own kingdom. Though he is lowborn and seemingly comes from nothing, uh, he is an expert swordsman, an expert tactician. He's able to play political games with lords and kings. Uh, he gains the love of nearly everyone around him. His soldiers loves him. Uh, Guts loves him. The small folk of the kingdom love him. Even his enemies love him. You know, he's really that bewitching. During the Golden Age arc, Guts overhears Griffith saying to someone that he could only see someone as an equal if they follow their own dreams. So Guts does just that. He leaves Griffith's mercenary group and tries to go down his own path to follow his own dreams. And this nearly breaks Griffith. Um, it, ups it upsets him so deeply that 
he starts making very rash decisions, such as sleeping with the king's daughter. Uh, this gets him imprisoned and tortured. It's the kind of like the worst torture you can imagine, a physical, mental, uh, and it goes on for nearly two years. Um, sometime later, he's rescued by Guts and members of his old mercenary company. Um, they escape, and then through causality, through some random events happening, Griffith invokes this mega death sacrifice ritual known as the Eclipse, where nearly all of his soldiers are transported into this other dimension filled with monsters and demons and horrors beyond imagining, and they're just ruthlessly killed, all the people who loved them, in order for him to be reborn into the fifth member of the God Hand named Femto. Uh, he also does some really bad things to a woman who loved him, uh, and that Guts loved. It's, you know, graphic, so, you know, you can imagine. So that's the long and short of Berserk and Griffith. Um, you can watch a whole myriad of videos comparing Griffith to Mikola if you'd like. Uh, instead, if you don't want to, or if you already have or you need something to remember, here is a short list of their similarities. One is that they're both kind of androgynous or beautiful. Uh, Mikola is eternally youthful and may be parading as Saint Trina, who people don't know if it's a young boy or a young girl. Griffith has this androgynous beauty where he has, you know, masculine features, but he also has very flowing, beautiful hair and a soft face. And he kind of uses that to his advantage to seduce men of power uh, in order he so he can get what he wants. Uh, both of them are linked to dreams in some way. Mikola, obviously, with uh, the St. Trina connection in sleep, there is some prevailing opinion that Mikola has something to do with dreams. I think that is due to c content. I'm not sure if it's something actually within the game, but still, it's something we associate the character with. Uh, Griffith has his dreams of his own kingdom. They also have a woman in their life who loves and respects them so dearly that they are willing to be their sword for them. In Mikola's case, it's Melania, who says that she is the blade of Mikola. And for Griffith, it's a character named Casca, who uh, says plainly that all she wants to be is his sword. There's also a cocoon rebirth connection between the two. Mikola embeds himself in the Halig tree in some sort of cocoon. He's abducted by Moog, and when we find him, he's kind of a husk of this, you know, kind of looks like Morgoth after we defeat him sitting inside this cocoon. Uh, both times Griffith is reborn. One of them is in like a cocoon egg type thing, and the second time is in this egg of the perfect world, as it's called, when he gets reborn into uh, the white hawk or the white falcon, whatever it's called. There's also a connection between eternal youth. Uh, Mikkel is, you know, eternally young, and Griffith on full moons will turn into a small child called Moon Boy. They also have a tree connection. Uh, Mikola has his Halig tree, where the base of his city, Alphael, is uh, located. And Griffith creates the world tree through some events. And at the base of the world tree is his city of Falconia. Um, Falconia and Alphael are fairly similar, where in Falconia you have monsters and men working together simultaneously. And in Elphiel, you have the misbegotten and the revenants and Albanorix. And I don't know if you heard my cat yell, but, you know, that's going to stay in. Uh, and, you know, regular humans, you know, all working together. So on face value, Mikola and Griffith look like they're, you know, one to one. Um, but the issue is, is that we're only looking at the surface level of both of these characters. You know, if you really want to know a person or a character, we have to start looking at their flaws. From what we know about Mikola, is that he's attempting to cure his sister Melania's rotting sickness, which appears to be due to the influence of the outer god of rot. Um, so far, with what we know in the game, we have no reason to believe that Mikola is not genuine in this cause. There is, you know, no item or scenario that shows us that we shouldn't believe he is genuinely trying to help his sister. He may be duplicitous in some areas. Like, for example, he may be using Melania's memory loss due to the rotting sickness to 
you know, have her do things that she might not do under normal circumstances. But we don't know if that's not to a means to the end to assist her. Um, if you watched my Eclipse video and were convinced by it, then you might agree with me that Mikola is this chess master. And he is playing all of the other demigods and our character as his pawns to enact some scheme. As a former Golden Order fundamentalist, he knows you can manipulate causality and regression to predict outcomes and ultimately create the outcomes that you want. Uh, an example I like to use is since I believe that Radigan and Marika are the same person and have the same goals, Radigan purposely put up the thorns on the Erd tree because if there were no thorns, you would have no reason to burn the Erd tree. So that would be uh, an example of using causality to get what you want. You create the cause so you can have the desired outcome and effect. When we look at Griffith's flaws, I think we can almost firmly say that from what we know of Mikola, uh, he is not like that. Griffith is incredibly selfish. All he ever does is for himself. He only wants his kingdom. His dream is to have a kingdom, and he explicitly says that, you know, he will do whatever it takes. If someone is willing to die for him, he will use that to his advantage to get what he wants. Um, he also just does really bad things to the people who love him the most. Uh, just, you know, the worst. He's probably one of the worst villains in you know, any piece of media that I have, you know, consumed because he doesn't really have any good redeeming qualities other than, other than he is stuck in causality himself. You know, we see through in the story, and I'll give you some examples shortly, that he's not this master manipulator. He has uh, the ability to gain love and adoration from people, but he doesn't use it in a way where he's thinking three chess moves ahead of everyone else. Uh, there's some scenes within the Golden Age arc where he is using his, uh, you know, tactician ability to predict what the nobles who want him deposed will do and figures out a way to assassinate them all at once without getting in trouble. But he's not really playing the Game of Thrones. He is in the flows of causality. He is really just a pawn for the God Hand. So we're going to take a step back and we're going to try and prove that Griffith is not this master manipulator. He is just a pawn. If we take out our books, I hope you came prepared. If we take out our books and we go to uh, volume 10, Infiltrating Winham 1, we find Griffith locked at the bottom of the Tower of not joy that is game of thrones the tower of absolution i don't remember the name of the tower and i'm not going to look it up uh he's sitting at the bottom of his cell it's deep 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 underground and these little bloodborne boys start pushing out bricks and start grasping at him they say oh prince prince of us the unforgiven we seek an audience with you at the time in that place we shall meet we are kinsmen Oh, blessed king of longing. And then he sees a vision. He's deep underground, and he sees a vision of the god hand in the second dimension. Later, he gets rescued by his compatriots, and then um, through some trying to, you know, end his life, he invokes the eclipse. And in the eclipse, the god hand presents itself. Void the mastermind. He tells our characters that all lies within the currents of causality. Everything has been determined. All of your lives have been spun into this sacred point in time, the eclipse. And here we're seeing that the God Hand is telling our characters that everything that has happened, it's happened because I want it to happen. You're here because of me so I can get what I want. Next, we're going to turn to volume 12, The Castle. This is during the eclipse. Griffith has to make the decision to sacrifice all of his friends, but he seems to be afraid, like he doesn't want to do it. So the God Hand show him a vision. They tell him this is not an illusion. It is the reality within the realm of your consciousness. He turns into a young boy and he's running through the city streets, maybe chasing after friends. And he comes up to this 
old woman who is spinning yarn, spinning his fate. Then he keeps walking forward and he finds a body of corpses. Uh, through dialogue, he learns that the message that is being said to him is that in order for you to get your kingdom, you have to kill this many people. These many people have already died for you to attain your dreams. What else more is there? The old woman appears again and she says, um, you know, I'm just trying to help you along the road. If you don't go to the castle, you will become a body just like them. In a few more pages, we see that this old lady is just Ubek and Conrad, two members of the God Hand, in a silly costume wearing a mask, trying to egg him on to commit this mass sacrifice. So what are we trying to say here? We're seeing that Griffith has his whole life determined by these interdimensional creatures. He is, you know, most likely this dream of having his own kingdom probably isn't his own dream. It might be a dream that was sent to him by the God Hand. Uh, later in the story, we know that the God Hand also sends a prophecy to the church, and they've had this prophecy for maybe hundreds of thousands of years. So we know that this is a plan that's a long time coming. So who is someone we could take these two pieces of? Someone who will do anything to ascertain their dream of having their own kingdom and will sacrifice whatever they can. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to put your best knee heels, knee heels, knee heels together for the Thunder from Down Under, the back to back to back three time Blood Bowl champion. That's right, I'm talking about the horniest half brother around, Mac Daddy Moog. Mac Daddy Moog was imprisoned underground due to being an omen, similar to how uh, Griffith was imprisoned in the Tower of Rebirth. Griffith has these visions of the God Hand calling out to him. And Moog has this uh, encounter underground where he meets the formless mother. Griffith has these dreams. Even though he's a lowborn man, he has these dreams of getting his home kingdom, which, you know, might seem impossible or delusional. And some people would describe, maybe Gideon the All-Knowing would describe Moog as a delusional maniac who only cares for his precious dynasty. The Band of the Hawk loves Griffith. Guts loves Griffith. Casca loves Griffith. The Princess of Windham loves Griffith, but he does not show that love in return. He has no love for them. Similar to Vare, who has all of this love for Moog and says that if you give yourself to Moog, he will return with his love to you. But when you defeat Vare at the mausoleum, he calls out for Moog and there is no answer because Moog does not love him. There is this mass amount of blood needed to somehow bring about the Lord of Blood's dynasty, very similar to the Eclipse, where a massive sacrifice of all of these people are required to, you know, bring about Femto and eventually Griffith's kingdom. And lastly, we see Griffith being manipulated by the God Hand for this to happen. And when we kill Moog, he says, I could see it, it's clear as day, the coming of our dynasty, Mogwin. So who's manipulating Moog if he is, as I say, Griffith? Well, the master manipulator himself, the mastermind with the mastermind. Void is Mikola. Griffith is Moog. The ugliness of Griffith is shown on the outside of Moog. And the ingenious of Mikola is hidden. It's not out front like Mo uh, Void, the mastermind. Uh, I think that Mikola bewitched Moog into bringing him to Caelid. The reason why he would bring him to Caelid? Well, he wants to take him to this underground felled tree stump. If you look at Mogwin from a certain angle, it kind of looks like a cut tree. And if you watch my Eclipse video, you would know that we came to the conclusion that in order to grow Erd trees, you need blood sacrifices, body sacrifices, and maybe some runes. You can even see that with the blood pooling around in that area, that the petrified tree stumps have life growing back to them. Above Mogwin is Caelid, and that is where Radon and Melania fought one of the worst battles of the Shattering. Not as bad as the assault on Volcano Manor, but it was pretty bad. Uh, and since they are on top and above each other, I hypothesize that the blood from that battle 
seep down into the earth into that one area. Why does Mikola want that to happen? I don't know yet. Maybe it's for some DLC time travel shenanigans. But that's essentially, from my perspective, Moog is the fool who is being played by Mikola. Similarly, how Griffith is the fool being played by the God Hand. They're both grasping at this unattainable kingdom and dynasty, but in reality, they are stuck in the flows of causality. Maybe this is a little bit of a reach, but you know, I don't see Mikola as being this disgusting, horrid villain like Griffith is currently within our story. And you know, I find some sympathy within Moog because Moog only turns out this way because he was imprisoned underground. Same way that Griffith turns out this way. Griff if Griffith was never tortured and lost his ability to fight or speak or move, he probably would not have invoked the eclipse. If Moog wasn't mistreated as an omen, he would not have visited the formless mother with his accursed blood so he can create a blood dynasty. So I hope you like that little theory. Uh, it's a little fun one. I, you know, I'm not trying to be contrarian, but I, I just don't see Mikola as a Griffith type. He looks like Griffith, but you know, mimic chests look like chests until you open them. And when you look deep down inside, you got, that's where you find where the real answers are. Uh, we still have the Carrion video, entire history of Carrion's coming out soon. I'm still getting all of my script together. The research is complete. When I say complete history, I'm talking all the way back, baby. I'm talking with the Newmans all the way to present day, with the motivation for each and every character within that royal line. We're even going to talk about the dog. It's going to be really fun, really exciting. To cap this video off, I want to give a shout out to YouTuber Mr. Paul. He commented on the Sage's Cave video that he made two videos about the Sage's Cave. They're uh, about 45 minutes each, and they're really well done. Um, I don't think he has a lot of views yet, but you know, you should you guys should check it out. It's a really well done video. Uh, it's not in a similar style to mine or anyone else for that matter. It kind of reminds me to how Quaylag does her videos, but give him a shot. It's a pretty good video. And then we're going to close out with two questions. Uh, you could still ask questions on the previous video. Um, these are just, you know, two quick ones, I hope. First question is, out of curiosity, what do you think the origin of Radigan is? I believe, oh, this is from Patricia, by the way. I think Radigan is most likely a mimic tier, uh, that, of America, and he, if he's not a mimic tier, that's fine, it doesn't really matter, but, you know, the only way you can get two of the same people in the known game is through mimic tiers, so the logical explanation is, he's a mimic. Um, he wants to be complete. Uh, he, you know, I, I see that he's just, you know, he's trying to, he's searching for something. He's a mimic of America. Um, I think the best example of looking at how mimic people would exist and assimilate into the regular world is to look at the Darian and Devian, Devon, the twin, uh, the twin brothers, uh, who are the hunters of death. One of them is cool, calm, and collected, and the other is a mad, raving lunatic, but both of them are still religious fundamentalists. So, you know, they have different personalities, but they're two different sides of the same coin. You know, they fill, together, they fill out one complete character. Uh, their sword, I think Antos actually picks this up in one of his videos, maybe. Their sword has this teardrop on it, uh, similar to the drop of do that the albinorics are supposed to be uh born from uh they are silver intertwined with gold which could be you know newman intertwined with nox or something of that nature but you know i think he is a mimic of america oh she also asks um what do you think the order of events as posited by tarnished archaeologists where there was a great tree that was felled from the stump grew sprouts in the primordial crucible and the culling of competing sprouts that led to the rise of the Erd tree. So my order of the timeline is the crucible, the primordial crucible is the first event. It's the thing that exists first. Then the Elden Stars lands into the lands between. It creates an impact that uh, creates the Safra and Ainzel River, allowing water to flow. I'm imagining that the runes 
shatter from the Elden Beast. The Elden Beast eventually becomes the Elden Ring. The rune shatter, it spreads down the river, and that is how we get orderly life throughout the Crucible. The Crucible is described as chaotic from the, uh, the Crucible Night Greaves, and there is a Oscar Wilde quote that goes something along the lines of, without order, nothing can exist. Without chaos, nothing can evolve. You know, you can have two hydrogen and an oxygen, but without them being together the entire time, always the same, without changing, you'll never have water. So that's kind of how I see it. As for the great tree being felled, well, when the Elden Ring was shattered, that is when the Erd tree seeds were spread throughout the lands between. And we see minor Erd trees growing everywhere and these uh, avatars popping up to protect these sprouting trees. You could see very young trees in the mountaintops of the giants and then you see older trees uh, the further south that you go. So if we know that the Elden Ring being shattered can produce seeds and we know that you can repair the Elden Ring, I think it's entirely possible that this isn't the first time that the Elden Ring has been shattered. I can see a perspective or a turn of events where Godfrey, is very similar to our player tarnished character. His main weapon is that of an axe, and he's a barbarian. I could see him chopping down other Erd trees and keeping one alive so he can monopolize, mon monopolize, mon uh, monopolize the sap and the dew to be the strongest guy around. You know, a crown is warranted by strength. So there may have been many more Erd trees in a more ancient time before civilization grew. And Many people can enjoy and bask in that sacred dew, that lifeblood that comes from these Erd trees. Uh, until, you know, Godfrey comes along, chops down the other trees, and kills everybody else. It's just a theory, but, you know, we can see that if you shatter the Erd tree, you get seeds. So it could happen, you know, more often than not. I hope that answer satisfies. Uh, our next one comes from Drossier361. Their question is... Oh, so you, you touched on Mogwin Palace looking like a stump and being fed by the blood of the battles at Caelid. This made me think about the dark tree wrapping around the black Erd tree in the DLC image potentially being fed by the corpse of Godwin. If Mikkel orchestrated the Night of the Black Knives and Godwin's death, it would make sense for Mikkel to be observing the tree from a distance. What if it is a dream of Mikkel to see this happen? So I think what they're saying is that it's Mikkel seeing the tree being swallowed by the, the black roots um, you know, we really can't assume too much from the image. Um, you know, it could be a dream, as in this is something that he wants to happen. It could be something that's occurring in a spirit dimension. It could be something that happens later down the timeline. Or it could be something that has already happened previously. This might not be the first, you know, time Death Root has existed within the Lands Between. There's many civilizations, the Ancient Dynasty, Far Missoula, the Sun Realm, uh, and then, you know, the Erd Tree Capital. There's many different eras within the lands between in a history. Uh, the Blackstone civilization and the Golem Makers, we don't know what happened during their times. But, you know, from my understanding of A Song of Ice and Fire and George R. R. Martin's science fiction works, the way that he likes to write his worlds is that they are a repeat or a cycle of things that have already happened. A great catastrophe or violence that has got the world to the state that it's in now. And those cycles of violence are repeating themselves and it's either up to our characters to accept and live within that cycle or attempt to try and break that cycle of violence. Um, if you watch my DLC prediction video, that is where I get the perspective of Mikola being kind of an outside force who is attempting to end the cycle. So for, you know, what's happening in that image, we, we won't know until we get the DLC. Um, there's so many things that it could be, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm right, then it's something that's already happened before. You know, Mikola has tried this plan before and it didn't work. Now he has to do it again with our Tarnished. Little uh, fun extra one is the one of the reasons I think that Mikola wants to be in Mogwin and wants all that blood there um, is that he is trying to send his spirit back in time. Uh, there's a thing that George R. R. Martin does in some of his sci-fi novels uh, I'm forgetting the name of one of the, the the one that I'm drawing this from, but essentially it's they send this guy's consciousness back in time so he can prevent a nuclear war, and they put him in this deprivation tank. He's floating in the water, and they pump him full of these drugs, 
and every time they do it, his mind goes back. And then if it doesn't work, he just wakes up back where he was right before it, and he does it again and again and again and again until he gets it right. In this story, he does it until he changes the future in the way that he wants it. So I can imagine that Mikola, when we meet him in the cocoon in game right now, that's just his body. It's not his soul. When you defeat Morgoth, uh, he, you get his great rune and his remembrance, and he's still able to talk to you, and he kind of looks like how Mikola does. So I think this could imply that Mikola's soul is not within his body, and that every time our player goes through the game, whether it's a new game plus cycle, whether it's you, whether it's me, that is a canon storyline that's happening. Uh, no matter what ending you choose, somehow Mikola hits the reset button, and he's like, all right, we got to do it again until you get it right over and over and over again. The cycle continues. Uh, you know, maybe it's the big splash of blood that comes down on him or something like that. So that's a little crackpot hypothesis. If that's right in the DLC, you link people to this video and you tell them to like and subscribe. And if it's wrong, this video doesn't exist. This channel doesn't exist. Don't tell anybody about it. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, the goal was to make a video that was easy for me to edit and to just get out there to you know share some ideas before we get some big reveals in the dlc um got a bigger video coming out the carrion history that one is like evergreen even if we get dlc i think it'll still work so thank you guys hope you enjoyed this one uh let me know if you like this style of video in the comments it's more of like a vlog style than your typical lore video uh and it was more of a you know, analysis of the story rather than telling you story bits. So, you know, I'm looking forward to your criticisms or your approval. All right. Bye, everybody.